Uh, we welcome strategic security expert and the former, uh, let me stand corrected there, the former director of the National Operations Center and uh, lecturer, Garvin Hira. He joins us on the Zoom line. And it's always good to see you, Garvin. Uh, great to have you with us this morning. Thank you for your time. Same here, Jason, and to your team in studio and to those who are streaming and viewing online. A very pleasant morning, Trinidad and Tobago, and the region. Indeed. Let me just adjust myself here, Gavin. So we find ourselves, Gavin, yet again in a place of uh, despair. Uh, over 100 murders in the first two months. It's something that is quite alarming. And at the current rate, uh, we might even surpass. I mean, I am not calling this. I do not want this to become a reality. But if we continue at this pace, uh, what we saw last year as the most murderous, the bloodiest year ever, that might be something that we could surpass if adjustments are not made right now. We heard the commissioner coming out, making the bold claim that by June, the murder rate will be down, despite we not hearing of any particular plans or seeing the template. Uh, what's your particular perspective in that regard? Can we indeed bring that murder rate down, and can we peg this situation back so we will not get to that 600 mark that we saw in 20? 22. Yeah, well, um, I mean, a, a lot of people, including including the media houses, um, would have tuned in to the GSC um, when the police and the executive um, were before the, the team, the panel, um, the room, and um, there was that exchange of questions and answers and providing a, a provision of, um, of information based on the inquiries that were, that, that were being projected. Um, yes, the commissioner did, in fact, say um, by June, and um, one has to understand that um, she understands, uh, well, it is hoped that she understands that sooner or later she would have been in the seat, she would have been in the running, um, she was um, competitively seeking to assume the position of uh, Commissioner of Police, and it is understood that as an executive vying for a position of that, of, 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 of that sort of esteem, um, would already be brainstorming, um, looking at some of the team members that she would want to come on board with her, and uh, more importantly, some of the strategies, the policies, the tactics um, that would like that she'd like to employ in order to achieve certain objectives. I'm, I'm speaking specifically from that proactive, predictive executive, and and therefore, um, assuming the seat would not mean I am now starting to work. Assuming the seat would be that it's just a matter of flicking the switch and, 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 and pushing forward um, or advancing my agenda and my plans so that I can achieve certain objectives that would satisfy those who would have agreed on ensuring that I be um, assigned with this position that they made a good decision. I'm, I'm saying that from an overall perspective. But the thing is, the commissioner did not ventilate these plans. Eh? We still don't know the template. We don't well, know the Well, this blueprint. is what I'm saying. So yeah. I'm hoping that yeah. um, her pronouncement of some sort of result um, by June would have been because I have some plans and it's already there and it's being, it's being done. Um, we don't know, we didn't hear that. And, and I, I mentioned in another place, um, there, there, were, there was some stuff that the citizenry wanted to hear. That was to be convinced, um, to be, to be, to be com comforted and to be confirmed. And we, we didn't hear that at the GSC. What she has said, basically, and must understand based on what she said is that, A, I am now running against the numbers. I'm running against the stats. I have to reduce these numbers, reduce these stats to prove my pronouncement correct by June. As an optimist, as an operational thinking leader and optimist, I think that she can achieve some of these low-hanging fruit, short-term objectives by June based on what she said. But it just doesn't happen with a pronouncement at the GSC. It has to happen with a robust, all-out coordinated approach involving all um, other arms of law enforcement, involving um, national security holistically and the ministries, and push hard against the numbers. Because she did mention um, one aspect, which was the precision policing, um, understanding that to be that it's targeted, um, surgical, and that they are aware of a handful of people that are upsetting this whole thing and holding us at siege. Just as we speak, a couple nights back, the entire Karanaj community, the, the foothills of Karanaj, were held under siege by severe gunfire, severe, heavy, high-powered automatic gunfire between rival gangs. This is what is happening in different areas of community. So, um, yeah, running until June is, is not bad. I can, I can reduce it by June. That's what she said. Then we need to see, as of that statement, that same day, 
a heavy hand operational tactical approach to do just that and I, we haven't seen that yet yeah and you know we, we look forward I'm watching even the comments from uh, citizens via our guardians uh, Vox Pop this morning and it's really mixed views eh? a young man by the name of Markel Batista store manager and Carapa Trimer said quote it's wishful thinking at least I think it's a grand plan that may never happen but we shall see ultimately but I don't believe it's possible and then somebody else says to be optimistic I just hope so you know uh, this is Pamela Mohammed a teacher from Princess Town she's basically you know suggesting that there are those saying that you know what let's give it a moment let's let's see if things happen in that regard but it must be a strategic and a I have to say it the word a, a heavy approach because no. the the gunmen uh, they are moving fearless they they have no care for limb there's no code of conduct anymore there's an issue with 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 you Gavin and I line with you this debating on everybody it's not like back in the day where a man ever, there's an issue with you they will come and target you one of my closest friends someone who would work would have worked for me for years a, a talented man in terms of handyman and painting Anthony passed away Carnival Tuesday because of a hail of bullets in, in, in the back of him over there and that one, me and I, I know, and I tell you, Gavin, that one hurt me, you know. When I see somebody so close to you, and he was just there, and it was three bullets, you know, these things, it's, it's hitting home. And yeah, it's exactly. becoming a kind of and place now where it's, it's, it's traumatic for the citizenry. Correct. And, and that, is, that is what needs to be echoed into the chambers of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and all other support agencies, that it has reached home. There's a fear now. In, in, in the hearts of the citizens. And if you are there to protect and serve and to provide that shield um, for the community and for citizenry, you must understand what is going through, what, what they are going through, what, what they are feeling. Now, um, you would have heard me say as an optimist and as an operational thinking person, one of our um, contributors in fact talked about being optimistic is, is good and whatever, but we also have to be very careful us as the media house, which I applaud for starting the conversation this morning and some of the other places that are sort of encouraging that dialogue, is that we cannot be pessimistic. We cannot show um, defeat um, in the eyes of the perpetrator, in the eyes of the criminal, because in that way it means that they are already on top. Even if psychologically, um, you know, the, the psychopathology of the victim, uh, the, uh, being, being a victim of crime, is that we feel that, you know, we, they have us um, in a corner we cannot express that. Our conversations has to be optimism. Our conversations has to be strong. Um, it has to be firm. And, and coming from law enforcement, it means that you have to be outside there ensuring that you send the message that we are going to turn this thing around. Because what will happen is that society, the citizenry, us as a nation will be defeated by a handful of criminal elements if we continue to show that fear and not speak out within the optimism that I think we can turn around. I think my role as a citizen, I can do something to assist. But of course, we're dealing with a number of other working parts in this whole thing. And one of them, as, as I said, has to be that the police service needs to adjust their trade craft and their whole approach to this thing and ensure that they can bring it under control. I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak this morning. And I know um, pre-interview we talked about, you know, some of the solutions, things that they can do. A simple thing is reviewing that national grid. The national grid, I heard it in the GSC being spoken about, but I didn't hear it being expanded on. And that is what I'm saying. You hear certain things mentioned and it stops at the first stop. No, it needs to be expanded upon. The national grid is really the platform that ties in to your CCTV system that was claimed that is now under upgrade and we're in introducing in Chagonas, introducing here, whatever. But the national grid ties into your CCTV system, ties into your command centers, and deals with the patrols and the units and the officers that you have on the ground. You strategically put these officers in certain places. You saw it working in San Fernando, and you it at one time worked um, well in, in Chagonas in that there was a sense, and I'm saying this boldly to the police service this morning, a sense of ownership to your area of operations. You have to own it. This is your territory. Nothing criminal with an intent, no crime coming through there is not going to be dealt with. You'll feel the brunt of the thing. We are going to own our national grid, own our territory, 
own our area of operations and we are going to control and contain that. Utilize the CCTV technology, utilize your command centers and pre-position your people so that even if a crime is committed, a carjacking involves a gun and the road, a robbery involves guns and the road, a shooting involves the road to the crime scene and then like back into your hiding place. We can take this thing and put it under control, but please review your national grid and mm -hmm. execute good policing and go out there and contain it and own it. Yeah. Simple as that. It's a strong, robust, high-handed approach to bring this thing down. Otherwise, we will continue to say, well, we have a strategy. Well, we have a policy. We are investigating here. Yeah. We're looking at resources. No, guys, come on. We are good police officers outside there. They are good, strong, operationally thinking, tactical police officers. Allow the system to utilize the tactics that are there and the systems that are already in place and execute it to its max. Gavin Hira is here with me on the Zoom line, uh, security strategy strategic security expert and i'm looking at the developments with human trafficking and even outside of what's happening within the political space it's a conversation and it's a word and it's a enterprise that's been here for quite a while and when you look at any business it's a demand and supply scenario and clearly we have to really look at ourselves deeply as trinbagonians because based on people's i guess they're pervasive and 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 their particular requests uh, in whatever realm, this particular industry seems to be striving. It seems to be something that is accommodated. And it is quite unfortunate because real lives are impacted. Young lives, um, people are caught in a serious web. Is this a scenario that we could turn around and fix? What's your perspective on this scourge that is human trafficking here in Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, the, the sad thing about it is that, you know, um, uh, an issue as serious as this, um, we went very quickly uh, towards the political football game and, and, and then politics started playing and everybody started switching, switching um, switches on and off um, in their rooms. Um, it does not look good. I, I repeat this to our leaders, our decision makers, those who are sitting in the armchairs of government and government officials, as we it had to take our U.S. ambassador to, to, to educate us, we didn't need that. Needs to know everybody sitting in the chambers there that are part of our parliament considered government officials. More importantly, if you are working for a government agency, you're an agent of the state, and you are within that whole realm, guys, you are a government official. It didn't take, we didn't have to wait on an, an external system to tell us that. We knew that. But... It was, it was sad to see how quick it went into, into, into a political issue the, rather than a serious um, international issue and for us an opportunity for us to shine and to show that we have capability and capacity to investigate and to prosecute. We didn't do that. Um, there has been, this, is, this has been going on for a long while. If you if you'd read back and you research, you'll recognize, wait a minute, these are some stuff that was quoted in 2018, 2017, 2020, you know? And um, my thing is, if it, if it did not caused the disruption as it did, which might have been good, this thing might have just passed us by and nobody would have done or said anything. There might have been no investigation launched this morning as we were reading based on the Office of the Commissioner of Police. So yes, it can be done, but we have to look outside of what was said as for Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, it's affecting Trinidad and Tobago right now, but um, Trini um, citizens, what we are talking about here is transnational organized crime. This is an international thing. This is, as you said, Jason, that it's a business venture with a business model, supply and demand, movement of money, involvement of persons who are legitimizing themselves as official business, and therefore something is working well inside of that whole enterprise. Um, Transnational organized crime is involved in what is known as the business and the economy of crime. And therefore, once there's an opportunity to, to make money illegally through criminal means, that is where they operate. But they operate so well that their tentacles are, are extended into the arms of government, arms of the judiciary, arms of the banking, arms of the whole system to ensure that there is facilitation and therefore proper what I'll call penetrative, intrusive investigations can, in fact, bring some of these things to the floor. Um, we would, we should see so now. Hopefully, a stronger working relationship with some of our 
um, foreign counterparts, our international counterparts, so there can be prosecution, there can be indictments, people can, people can be sent away to, to face um, certain other courts because of their involvement. Don't think that this is a Trinidad issue. It may have up, up, um, occurred in our jurisdiction, but it may have relevance in another country. It may have relevance with another currency. It may have relevance with another nationality. Mm -hmm. So it brings us to the point, and I don't want us to miss this, Yes, human trafficking is the buzzword, it's the banner, it's the elephant in the room. But we have not paid specific attention to our border control management. Well, I'm not going to ask Had that, we, because I, I'm wondering, are we victims of our location? Us being so south, the most southern island in the chain, um, hence the reason Trinidad being that transshipment, obviously things moving from the south to go up north, it will pass through here and then go further up north to, to the bigger markets. Are we ultimately, because of our location in this particular predicament? A product would have passed through Trinidad and Tobago and by extension our, our islands here in the region because yes, we are a transshipment point. So if that product was narcotics, if that product was organs, as is in some, some areas, hopefully we, it, <laughs> the stats are not showing that for Trinidad and Tobago. If that product was any sort of contraband, now it's human beings, it would have passed through the same channels, utilized the same sort of systems to get to the, to the other destinations, be it the US, Europe, and in some instances, East, um, the certain parts of, 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 of even Africa when it came to narcotics. And, and that is what we have to understand. And therefore, our border control management should have recognized it is to strengthen or to prevent or to deter that sort of smooth running. And border control management is not just the patrolling of our territorial waters. Border control management is securing your spaces, which also involves um, a joint approach by immigration customs, the national security entities, and more importantly, political will to ensure that we can investigate and prosecute and a message is sent. It has to be a strong, we have to basically lift the bar, lift our walls of prevention. It is that rampart approach, 360 degree approach to strengthen our border control management. We, we were a bit myopic when we started talking about border control management, didn't recognize that, wait a minute, it would leave cracks for things like human trafficking, the small arms and light weapons trade, and inclusive of, of, of illegal narcotics. So my message to national security this morning, as you prepare yourselves and reshuffle your systems to start looking at this thing that, re that rose on us the last couple of days, human trafficking. Hold on a minute and extend that planning and the policy-driven approach to ensure our border control management is exercised in such a way that it contributes to the prevention and the deterrence of human trafficking involving intelligence gathering, the technology and our intelligence architecture, and the utilization of the resources that are available with our international counterparts. Border control management is the stopgap to treat with human trafficking. We have to go all the way back there and fix the thing coming forward. Gavin, I want to thank you as always for your recommendations, for the perspective. Um, you know, we We'll see how things pan out. I agree that we must be optimistic. We must win that psychological battle so that the criminal elements don't ever one day feel they have the one up on us, the citizenry, and they are actually in the minority. We are the right thinking, I, I believe, you know, functional citizens. We are in the majority, but we are fearful, and we must change that particular reality. Just a couple of seconds before we take the break. Any closing remarks? Just a couple of seconds before we take that break, Gavin. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to encourage our citizens to be very vigilant outside there and to work with our law enforcement officers as we combine our resources, both from the citizenry and from the services, to ensure that we could control and bring this whole situation of crime and homicides um, back to some semblance of order. Um, so increase your vigilance, escalate your vigilance, and ensure that you look over your shoulder at all times. Um, Self-preservation, first line of defense. Hey. As always, thank you, and we'll touch base soon. Gavin Hira there, Trinidad and Tobago, strategic security expert and lecturer and former director of the National Operations Center. We take a very quick pause and come back with the police and you segment. It's up next.